Welcome, everybody. This is Lessons from Leaders. I'm Lynn Gilliland. As you know, we are sponsored by Humentum and LG Consulting, and I am so honored. I feel very honored to have Vivian Anderson with us today. She is the founder of Every Black Girl, and um, I, I even feel a little emotional talking about it. So we're just going to jump right in. We're going to talk about how Vivian started uh, and it brings incredible leadership for what you are doing, Vivian. So I am so grateful that you took time to be with us today. So welcome. Yeah, so thank you for having me. I so appreciate being here. And whatever I can contribute, I'm ready to contribute. Um, but I'm very honored to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Well, you're already um, contributing. So this part, you'll be contributing just like what what, how you showed up, how you are to um, be the founder of Every Black Girl. So you started it from nothing. So, you know, why don't you talk about how it came to be and, and what your involvement was? And so can you tell us the story? Yeah. Okay. So uh, October 26, 2015, a video went viral of a young girl who was assaulted by a young black girl in a classroom, assaulted by a white school resource officer, male resource officer. Um, I was living in Brooklyn, New York, and my roommate at the time, she was working for the Miss Foundation. And she called me and was like, did you see the video? But I was also part of Black Lives Matter New York. Um, I had done work um, in Ferguson. We're doing work around Sandra Bland. We're doing all this stuff. And I remember her calling me and I was just like, yeah, I can't. I can't watch another child being harmed. I can't do it. And she was like, no, you have to watch it because then you'll know what to do. And it was part of me saying, what you mean? I don't know what to do. And so I went to, you know, I got up the courage to like watch the video and as I'm trying to like navigate, because elder privilege, I'm like, okay, how I get to the video? Um, the video that came up first was her classmate that stood up for her, Naya Kenny, and it's Naya being released from jail. And she's saying, like, I knew I had to stand up for her because she had no one else. Mm. And something like just broke down in me. It like it. I don't even know how to describe the feeling that I felt when this child was saying, like, the only thing we have is each other. So children are saying the only thing they have with each other. And like, no, but we're doing this work. This is what we say. And these adults, we're here for these kids. The kids are like, no, nah, she ain't have nobody. I had to take that stand. And, um, you know, then I saw the video. Then I saw the video. And, you know, like I tell people, I probably didn't sleep for a couple of days. And so I called my friends together and I was like, hey, what are we about to do? We show up here, we show up there, you know, but this child, how are we showing up? And um, long story short, because I don't want to keep people, um, it ended up that they supported me because at that point, I couldn't even afford a plane ticket or any kind of ticket they helped me, you know, they supported me in buying a ticket. And then I came to South Carolina and I thought I was going to be joining organizations who are already on the ground doing work. But what I was encountered with, it was like, oh, you came here because two black girls got in trouble or you got, came here. And the more I talked to like community members and the more I like start like in those two days, the more I start like just hitting the grounds because that's who I am. Like I'm a door knocker, like, hey, what's going on? Um, I realized there was a larger con conversation to be had and whew, I don't even know how to explain it. I just feel like Pandora's box opened up mm. remnants of enslavement, what it means to live in the South, what's happening with black girls, what's the gender conversation, what school to push out, you know, the prison, the, um, the school to prison pipeline, all those things kept coming up for me. And I was just like, wow. And then more importantly, what was the unaddressed trauma and how do we heal that? What does it mean to like actually create the world we dream about? And what kept coming up for me is like, how do we start healing so we can actually see each other? Because if I'm hurt, I can't see you because I'm so engulfed in my hurt. And so um, 
that's how we got started. It started off as a campaign. We wrote a letter to black girls, but to me, the letter wasn't enough. So the letter that we wrote that went viral, like they were right, you know, it was online and everything. I was intentional about, uh, you know, bringing it to these two girls and hugging them and saying, Hey, you, we got you. And it was very intentional. My, my thing was like, I feel Pollyanna about it. All I wanted to do was hug two girls. And from that one to hug two girls, I met so many people and so many other young people and adults who had so like years of unaddressed trauma. I will never forget that I was invited to a healing session and there's a social worker. She was like 60 plus years old and she had admitted for the first time her rape as a child. Mm-hmm. And I was like, this is what this work is about. If we don't like our, with every black girl, our belief is for every black girl to thrive, the world around her has to thrive. Mm-hmm. So in order for her to heal, the people around her have to be healed. And so that's what our work has been. And so that's how we got started. It was just like, I felt like I was being obedient to God because I would never remember. I, I like shot up in the middle of the night, like, well, what you mean, God, you want me to go to South Carolina? I don't know. Like South Carolina. Oh, I know the history. Mm-mm. You want me to go to the South? I know my family is from the South, but you want me to go? And I got up and the rest has been like, well, we say history and I'm here. I relocated my life to South Carolina to elevate the Southern Black girls and women voice in this national conversation about racial, gender, social, economic, all the injustices we get to bring Black girls and women into this conversation, especially ones from the South. There's so much there um, to look at and unpack. And I know that you told me previously that you had people supporting you or saying, maybe you can do this. They saw some people saw something in you that you didn't see yourself. Am I getting that right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even when they brought me the ticket, Mm -hmm. they were like, okay, that ain't on our agenda, but. And I remember I was working for Girls for Gender Equity and I was supporting them. We were looking at push out with um, black girls in school and Joanne Smith, who's the um, CEO and founder of Girls for Gender Equity. She said, I remember you came back in the office, said, I'm just going up there to just talk to the girls. She said it was something in your eyes and I knew you were never coming back. And I was like, I'm not leaving. I'm working with these girls. Um, And there were folks who are just like. When are you when I got to South Carolina and I would just talk to folks and they were like, well, what's the name of your organization? What you doing? When are you coming back? And I didn't have an organization. It was just me coming and saying, like, how can I support? What can I do? Um, And folks saw something in me that I just didn't see. I just knew that, like, my heart just I couldn't sleep. My heart couldn't rest. And more than anything, like, what does justice look like? The more I asked that question. People had different definitions of what it looked like. And then I was like, oh, my goal is to like have everybody feel justice for themselves, not me to find it, but mm. and folks trust it. And that's I'm interesting. Here today. <laughs> and so like you you got uh, you were you felt motivated, you felt called by God, you you felt the purpose, you couldn't. You had to follow it. And the part I want to underline and tell me if I'm getting this right is you didn't see all the steps. You just took a step and then you took another step. Um, and you wouldn't, what, well, the things that you are doing at every back row right now is not, you didn't see that in front of you. You were just, you know, the th- journey of a thousand steps begins with the first step is what comes up for me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you said it correct. I, I didn't know. I thought I was going to be here for two days. I had no idea that I was going to end up relocating my life. Mm. All I knew is there was something go. I, you know, I was living in New York City at the time. Right. I was looking in Brooklyn, New York. Remember, it's it's the post 9-11 and all the things you see something, say something. I was one that's just like, I've been told, I've been trained with my mother who God rest her soul. I love my mother. You just don't see something and say something, you do something. And so I saw something, I said something, 
then I was like, well, what do I do? Right. And like, cause I, I'm not one that wants to go on social media and like type all this stuff, but what do I do? And I was like, go and just go. It just, I had to go. And then when I got here, I had to stay. Uh, a, and then it was step after step after that. Cause I was like, what I'm doing, what are we doing here? What, what's going on? The reason I think this story is so important um, is that a lot, a lot of us get stopped if we don't know what the how is. You didn't know the how. You just knew to go and do the thing that occurred to you in the, at that moment. So without knowing the whole, the, the whole how, you just knew what the why. I'm going to go do it. And that's one of my favorite book titles is the answer to how is yes. You just say yes and the how will figure itself out. And the other um, part I want to pull out is just the courage that it took to do it. And I don't know if you felt courage. Um, and it must have, there must have been, I'm just guessing there must have been concerns, not maybe for the two days, but maybe even for the two days. Like, what am I doing? Why me? Like, who am I to be doing this? I don't know. Can you speak to that at all? Yeah, all the things you just said, like that was like those and those were my everyday conversations. Right. Well, one, I thought I was going to be stepping into this embodiment of this organizing. Right. I thought there was going to be tons of people organizing around this. And I'm just stepping in because in New York or when I went to Ferguson or if we went to Texas for Central all those things. It was like, oh, there's going to be those folks there. There weren't those folks. So. I remember like, okay, where I'm going to stay tonight, what I'm about to do. And, but something kept calling me saying, you have to be here. So I was like, okay, so I'm here. Um, and then after I got here and I got settled in, there was moments where I'm like, okay, how are you about to pay rent? Mm -hmm. How are you going to feed yourself? What's about to happen? But like I say a lot and I've spoken this. It's just like, I couldn't make that the bigger conversation. If I was called here, this is what I'm going to do. And then I was like, I don't have the academia that everybody else has. I don't even consider myself an organizer. At that point, I didn't consider myself an organizer or activist. I was just like, I'm a woman that feels something. And hey, if, if you if something is not happening right, you're supposed to do something because that's the legacy that I've been taught. Right. But I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't have this blueprint. I didn't have this family structure that showed me how to do it. I'm just stepping in at an older age, right? Like, let's be clear. Most of the folks I was with, they're in their 20s, like 30s there. They're young activists. They call themselves activists. That was not never a title that I put with myself. So yeah, there were many times where I was just like, I don't know what I'm doing, but I know I'm supposed to do this. If it ain't right, I'll learn it and then I'll recorrect it. I can't go back, but then I'll course correct. And so that's how it just started moving from since I got here. I love that philosophy. I, I would like to see that written down, like the five things to, to follow. Like don't, you said, don't make it about yourself, the larger conversation. If it goes the wrong way, you'll course correct. Um, if you ever decide to write a book, I'll, you know, make sure you add those things. And listen, I need y'all to stop saying that to me. <laughs> I don't know what this thing is about people in books, <laughs> but like, I like once again, I'm going to tell y'all I'm not an academia. I don't know how to write no book. <laughs> I will take that on board. Then everybody needs to write these things down for yourselves. This wisdom is here verbally. So can't write it down for your own selves. And I honor that. I also am, have no book in me. Um, let's talk about, you know, what, when you look back at your own trajectory or your own journey, what, um, what, what either advice would you have given yourself looking back or what advice would you give other people about being a leader that you, that you have learned that you wish other people knew? Yeah, I think one of the things that I'm learning is that um, so 
I'm going to keep saying this. Like, so I have a God source, right? And I, I, I lean a lot towards that. Yours can be universal or you can have a God source. That's not the sky God where we're supposed to look up and this God, this God is in the sky and this, you know, but if I would um, give myself anything, it's just like who you are is okay. Mm. You are enough. And I think no matter what I do, I always feel like I'm never enough. And like, I'm judging myself against everybody. But I think if I'm like going to go moving forward, I'm learning how to say many are called, few are chosen. I've been chosen for this moment. So I'm going to honor the fact that I was chosen for this moment, even if it don't make sense to me. Because sometimes my controller side of me mm-hmm. wants to control everything. But sometimes it's just like, okay, my obedience, I will continue to be obedient and say whatever is pulling my heart and whatever's put there, I get to follow it and it's going to be okay because I'm very, I'm a very resourceful woman, right? Like I know how to create for myself. I know if I need to go work at McDonald's tomorrow, I'll be there tomorrow. So my ego always get in the way and I have to challenge it sometimes. Um, but it really is like what I bring to the table is enough and it's what's wanted and needed. And it's been called for, for some reason, because I wouldn't be here today. If it wasn't, people kept asking me to come back. And if I stop second guessing myself, people will stop second guessing me. And most people aren't second guessing me. It's just me. So trust in who I am and trust in the calling that I feel on my life. Thank you, Vivian, for that wisdom. Um, I think that'll resonate. I know it resonates with me, and I'm pretty sure it's uh, universal with many of us. Do you want to tell us about the documentary on these grounds? Okay, so on these grounds was um, a documentary that was created for the like when I came here. There was a girl who was sought in a classroom, and there was a classmate that stood up for her two black girls who both ended up with federal charges, like criminal charges against them under what is called the disturbing schools law. And so a film crew called disturbing films (laughs) um, reached out to the girl Naya who actually videotaped what happened. Mm -hmm. Um, And they reached out to her and she's like, Miss Vivian, these people want to talk to me. And so then they reached out to me. And at that point, somehow I was the only two that was really in direct contact with the two girls, because one of the things I I, I made a commitment to myself and I had made a promise to God that once I got to South Carolina, I wasn't going to leave until I hugged both those girls. Mm -hmm. And so um, now it's been four years watching what's happening from the assault to what's happening to the girls now. And not only that, you hear so many different voices like Ben Fields, the officer that assaulted her. Um, one of the things, cause we're lessons from leaders, mm-hmm. there's going to be difficult conversations that you do not want to have. And one of mine was sitting face to face with a Ben Fields and creating a, re- a relationship with a man that harmed two black girls. When my work is about protecting black girls, but I knew I had to have this conversation, no matter how uncomfortable it made me feel. If he's going to be in this world with black girls, I had to have this conversation. It would have been so easy for me not to. But then that's not my calling as a leader. If I'm saying like, this is my work. What are the places that are so uncomfortable and I want it to be easy, but it ain't about easy, but it was easeful. It was an easeful conversation. It wasn't an easy conversation. It was an easeful conversation because I already knew it wasn't about me. It was just through me and whatever any other black girl needed. So they wouldn't end up in that position. I had to be the one that sat with him because nobody else was willing to. And what are the places that we're willing to step into when nobody else wants to? And um, yeah, so the documentary will take you through what's happening with policing in schools. It covers all that. It looks like the history, what created policing. It takes about the, talks about the land specifically in the South. Um, I don't 
wherever your lens is, I think there's something that everybody can get from it. So it's powerful on these grounds, um, multiple streaming forms that you always tell people to go to Amazon because that's what I know. But I know it's Apple TV, iTunes, um, YouTube, and so many others. Vimeo is something that I wasn't familiar with until now. But I think it's a powerful for this moment in time when we want to start, you know, I know people talk about critical race theory, but we want to talk about history. And when we want to talk about what is critical race theory, I think part of what happened with Spring Valley opened us the Pandora's box for us to see this all. So it's something I recommend everybody to see. And again, it is on these grounds. On these grounds, yes. And uh, do put us a, in a uh, if you do watch it, not you, Vivian, but our watchers, our viewers, let us know. Send us a, put us a, a note, a message. Um, so, Vivian, I, I am so grateful that you spent the time with us. Uh, I've learned so much from you. And thank you for the work that you do, for taking the time to be on our podcast. And we will be following you. Okay. Thank you. And just everybody, just if I can say anything, um, oftentimes people have these conversations and you know the leader that you have inside of you. Mm. You do not have to mimic anybody else. Your calling and what you've been purposeful on this earth for is only yours. Trust that I call it the ping in your heart. And that's the thing we run away from most because we often want to be here. Does it make sense? Does it do this? Does it do that? If there's a ping in your heart, that's where leadership starts. And so that's what I will offer to folks. It may look different from everybody else. Your ping may be, I'm supposed to check on my neighbor next door. That's leadership because somebody else is not doing it. And because you did it, somebody's going to watch you and then they're going to do it. So whatever that ping in your heart is, I would say follow it even when this don't make sense, because at some point the two are going to come together and it's going to make the perfect union. So Beautifully said. I will be paying attention to the ping in my heart. Thank you, Vivian. Thank you. 